Um, I'm in Baker, and this is where I currently live. I mean, I'm currently emergency housed is the term, I guess. Uh, this is in West Campus. West Campus is generally where student life is. Like, um, all of the, most of the dorms are in West Campus. Uh, the student center is in West Campus. A lot of the sports places and stuff are here. As you can see, there are like a couple people playing tennis there. Um, across of that, you can see the new dorm. It's new Vassar, West Garage. Uh, and you can see, can you see Simmons in the distance? There's like other dorms over here. And I'm gonna head down the stairs and I'm gonna show you more, I guess. This was an MIT tour. Um, our first stop is probably going to be the student center or the stud, which is that huge, ugly building over there. Yeah, brutalist architecture is valid, but I don't like it. Anyway, the stud is the student center. Like I said, it has like five floors. In the basement, there are some like amenities, like a post office, a barber shop, an optometrist, and then. Um, over on like the first floor and the second floor are like several dining areas for students. Um, on the fourth floor of the stud, uh, are, there are like a bunch of offices for the different student groups on campus. So um, MIT has like a lot of student groups. I think like on the order of like 600 or 700 or something, which is like a lot, considering that we only have like 4,000 or so undergraduates. We have student groups from like you know, the Sloan Business Club to stuff like the Chocolate Club. Um, one of the student groups I'm involved with is called ESP, the Educational Studies Program. And their office is also in the stud. It's like the fourth floor of that building. And um, what we do is we run programs for like middle school and high school students where people in the MIT community can come and like teach them classes about whatever they want. And it's really fun. Um, starting up a club is like very frictionless because like you know I helped like restart the Filipino Student Association after it wasn't active for a long time and it really wasn't that bad anyway if this was a student tour like an admissions tour I would be standing in this bench right here and I haven't given a tour in a long time so I'm gonna stand here and make myself feel better um, over here to my left your right you can see the Kresge Auditorium the Kresge Auditorium is like this huge building in the shape of an eighth of a sphere. And the way that, the reason it's shaped like that is so that like as little supports are needed as possible in order to support it, which is pretty cool. Um, it seats up to like 1,200 people. So like during orientation, the entire first year class just comes in and like sits in there. And it's like pretty cool. Um, a bunch of like acapella groups and performances also happen in there. So MIT has like... 12 million acapella groups like Syncopation, The Logs, um, some other ones that I'm not doing justice to right now. Uh, we also have a bunch of like, you know, theater groups and stuff. And they perform in like the Kresge Little Theater, which is like in the basement of Kresge Theater and it seats around like a hundred or so people. We have like the Shakespeare Ensemble and the Musical Theater Guild and that other one that I'm forgetting and I'm being really bad. Um, over here to my right, your left, that's the MIT chapel. It's um, in the shape of this like, like this brick cylinder. And it's like really nice because like during, during like the summer, there's like a moat around it. And then the sunlight just like goes into the water and bounces off the moat and like comes into the building and like those, those little things underneath. And it lights the building up from the inside and it's just really nice. The MIT chapel is like non-denominational, so like, anyone can use it we've had group we have groups like you know we have christian groups catholic groups um muslim groups buddhist groups uh you know uh, like anyone can really use it and it's nice i'm not religious myself so i can't talk a lot about this but i do have friends who are so yeah i don't know um next we're gonna so if this was a student tour, this, if this was an admissions tour the next stop would be the gym so into DuPont, we're going to go. Uh, this is supposed to be the part of the tour where I talk about athletics, but I don't know a lot about athletics other than what we're supposed to say in the tour. So I guess I'm going to say that. Uh, MIT is Division 3 in all, in like 22 something sports and Division 1 in crew. Um, we have like the largest Division 3 program in 
the nation, apparently, whatever that means. I wouldn't know much about that. Um, we have like, you know, a huge swimming pool inside, uh, like, a tra like an ice rink and a bunch of stuff. This is also supposed to be the part where I talk about the PE requirement of MIT. And um, the MIT PE requirement means that you have to take four PE classes before you can graduate. Um, the way PE classes work is that you take them for like half a semester or like a quarter, and you have to take four of them in order to graduate. I already said that. We have a swim requirement as well, which means that you have to pass a swim test before you graduate, or you have to take a swim class. And I don't know how to swim, so that's terrifying for me. Apparently, you have to do like three laps of the pool, and this is supposed to be like half the width of the Charles River. So if you fall down anywhere in the Charles River, you only have to swim like half the width in order to get to the shore, assuming that you pick the right half, which is like, I don't know, we're engineers, I guess. We're supposed to know how to do that. Um, I haven't taken the swim class yet. I was supposed to take it like for the second half of the spring semester, but look what happened. Oops. Um, do we have like lots of different PE classes that you can take to fulfill the PE requirement? There's like, you know, fun stuff like archery or pistol or like you can take swing dancing and square dancing and meditation and uh, HIIT and other stuff. Um, there's also something called the pirate certificate where if you take like these four classes, uh, sailing, archery, either pistol or this other thing and this other one that I'm forgetting right now. And if you take all four classes, MIT will give you like a pirate certificate and say that you can like sail the high seas or something. I don't know, that's fun. Uh, all right, so that's it for West Campus. Wait, no, that's not it for West Campus. There's this one other part that I need to show you and it's the dorms. So uh, this is like dorm row, which is like a row of dorms. There's like, you know, Massey, McCormick, Baker. That's where I'm currently housed. Um, there's Baker, there's like a bunch of frats. Uh, there's McGregor, there's BC, there's New, and there's Next, and there's Simmons over there, and there's West Garage, which is currently being constructed. And these are like some of the undergraduate dorms. We have Random Hall, which is over in the north, and East Campus, which is over on the other side of campus. And um, all first year MIT undergrads are required to live on campus, and a lot of people choose to live here for all four years. Like 93? No, like 90% or so. I'm really bad at these numbers. Um, a lot of people also choose to like live off campus. So around like 10% of people choose to live like in either off campus housing or with one of our FSILGs. FSILG stands for Fraternity, Sorority, or Independent Living Group. And we have around like 20 or so fraternities and around like 10 or so sororities and like seven independent living groups. And around like 50% of men and like I have no idea, like 40% of women, I'm so bad, uh, are so, like um, associated with one of these FSILGs and like 10% or so choose to like live with them. Okay, don't trust me on these numbers. These numbers are just so wrong and I haven't reviewed these numbers in a long time. Um, yeah, I would talk more about the dorms, but like that's probably something best left for another time, I guess. Anyway. Uh, we're gonna head over to the other side of campus now, which is main campus, which is like, I don't know, it's main campus. Really good weather today. The weather is almost never this good during like the winter or like early, like earlier in the year, like January, February. So this is just like really nice. Yeah, I don't know. Um. I wish we had more of this kind of weather. Like back in the Philippines, the coldest it ever got was like, like mid twenties or so, and that's in Celsius. So like the coldest it got here last, like the coldest it got here during this winter was like in like negative, negative six, negative 10 or so, which is like really cold. So yeah. Getting a good coat is like a pretty important part. So we're heading into Lobby 7. And um, okay, you'll notice that I called it Lobby 7 because it's the lobby of Building 7. And 
The cool thing about MIT is that all of our buildings have numbers. Um, a lot of buildings also have names. Like, for example, Building 7, which we're in, is also called the William Barton Rogers Building. But nobody calls it that. And in fact, I only learned what its name was, like, a few minutes ago when I was looking it up. So, uh, yeah, the cool thing about uh, our buildings is that, for example, this is Building 7. And the way that the numbering works is that when you say, like, a room, like, for example, this is like room 717120. That means that's in building seven. The one tells you that it's the first, it's on the first floor, and 120 is like the specific room. So, oh, and also all of our courses are numbered. So, like, for example, course one is civil and environmental engineering, course two is mechanical engineering, course three is material science, course four, architecture, and so on. And all the classes are numbered as well. So for example, one class I took last semester was 18701, Algebra 1. So the 18 tells you that it's in math, and the 701 is a specific subject, Algebra. So 18701 is Algebra 1. And it just becomes weird when you like say a bunch of numbers in a row, like, oh yeah, I have 18701, MWF 11 in room 2190, and it means that you have Algebra 1 on Mondays, Wednesday, Fridays from 11 to 12 at building 2, room 190. And you just kind of get used to it after a while. Um, at first, it's just like a bunch of numbers. But if you ask people what they mean, they're generally nice and they'll say, uh, yeah. Um, if this was an admissions tour, I would be walking down the infinite and then turning right over there. And the reason being is that we don't usually walk the entire length of the infinite because that usually like clogs it up and like, you know, that's generally impolite because it like, blocks the way for other people but like I guess that isn't really a concern right now because it's literally empty so I guess we can walk the length of the infinite uh yeah this is the infinite corridor without any people it's very odd for the infinite corridor to be like this empty during the day because usually there are like way more people than this um one of the cool parts about the infinite corridor that I can't really show right now is how like all the bulletin boards are usually replete with posters from student groups advertising stuff and it was kind of sad because like I walked into the infinite like the other day and I saw this bulletin board and there were only three posters on it and I was like whoa what happened like nobody is here oh yeah this one still has a bunch of posters and this one also has a bunch of posters as well See, this one is already like a bunch of posters taken down and that's like kind of sad. All right. Um, this is also roughly the part of the tour where I talk about academics. So the way that academics, so the way that classes work in MIT is that each class carries a certain number of units. Um, the typical class carries 12 units, which means that you're expected to spend roughly 12 hours a week, both in class and out of class, of work for that class. So. A typical course load can be anywhere from like 36 to 60 units. 48 units is the most common because most people just like, up, like the majority of people take like four classes in a semester. Um, uh, yeah. The way that majors work in MIT is that you can't declare a major until the end of your first year, which is nice because it means that when you get admitted into MIT, you don't get admitted into a specific course. You just get admitted into MIT and you can like have the freedom to explore whatever you want and like just take classes even if they're not related to your major. And I think that's pretty interesting because it doesn't mean that you're restricted to taking general institute requirements or just like classes that you have to take in order to graduate. You can just take whatever classes you want and no one's gonna stop you. Um, one of my friends, for example, is taking two double OB. I mentioned earlier two is for mechanical engineering and double OB is the class. Two double OB is toy product design and in the class you're like, you know, you work with like a local organization in Boston and you design these toys for kids. And um, it's a project-based class, so I don't know what's gonna happen to them given that, you know, with all the class suspensions recently, but he has like no plans to do mechanical engineering at all after this. So I think that's pretty cool that you can just take classes for fun and no one is gonna stop you. Uh, what else? We also have these things called GIRs, which are general institute requirements that you have to take in order to graduate. Uh, you need to take 
two calculus classes, two physics classes, a chemistry class, and a biology class. And you also have to like, you know, full, you have to take eight humanities classes by the time that you graduate, and you have to like fulfill also your major requirements, and you have to do the swim tests. And these are like most of the requirements that you need in order to graduate. I think that's it. Um, yeah, this is getting awkward, and I'm running out of things to say, so I'm gonna head out. Uh, this is. Lobby 10, which is the lobby of building 10. Usually there will be a bunch of student groups, like a bunch of tables for people with like student groups to like advertise their stuff, like selling food and giving out posters and things. Uh, we're gonna head out into Killian Court. So this is Killian Court. That's locked. I imagine most of these are locked actually. I would be surprised if this was open. Yeah. Uh, we can take the other door. Yeah, let's take the other door. The door that I would usually take when for an admissions tour. Notice about most of the buildings in MIT is that they're actually connected with each other. And the fun fact is that all the buildings in the main group are connected to each other and you don't even have to go, go out in order to go into another building. Just pretty convenient because, you know, in the winter it's like really, really cold and, you know, you don't want to go out before like going in and head into another class, which is like nice because you get to go in between the buildings without ever having to go out. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to head out into Killian Court. Killian Court is, you know, this huge field court grass thing in front of the dome of Building 10. It's a nice day out. It's just so nice. Uh, yeah, over here, that's the Charles River and the rest of civilization as we know it. And over here is the dome. That's Building 10. And this is usually also the part of the tour where um, we stop around here. And then I say, you know, if you want to take any pictures in front of the dome, now is a great time and we're going to take a short break. But I guess you can like take pictures virtually in front of the dome. Haha. -ha. Anyway, this is the part of the tour where I also talk about um, hacking. So hacking is this like MIT kind of like student edition where the students like play practical jokes on the administration. Uh, usually they involve like decorating some sort of like fixture in MIT. The Great Dome, for example, is a good target for hacks. Recently you may have heard the news when like, you know, they put a Captain America shield on top of the big dome and that was nice. Uh, you may have also seen the recent picture circulating about how they put like a Purell dispenser on top of Kresge and that was pretty cool. I mean, very timely, I guess. Um, one of the more famous hacks is the police car on top of the dome. So it was around the time when like the MIT police was giving out a lot of parking tickets. Like they were giving more like tickets than usual because people were like parking in places where like they supposedly weren't allowed to. And then like people thought, like I guess some students thought that this was unfair. And this way the story goes is that people woke up one morning and there was like, you know, a police car on top of the Great Dome. And it's just like this replica of a police car, right? It was just like painted on the outside to look like an actual police car. There were like seats inside and everything. There was this inflatable policeman, a box of donuts, and a ticket saying that the car was illegally parked on top of the dome. And that was just like, you know, I guess that was it. And the, the way the story goes after that is that um, the administration like had to like take some time. Like it took them like three days before they got the police car disassembled and put down. When they did disassemble it, they like put it on top of Killian Court. And then I guess people thought what a shame it was that it's just on top of Killian Court. So the next morning, it was back up in the dome again. And then they left instructions on how to disassemble it and put it back down. So yeah, I guess that's how that story goes. Um, I, this is also the part of the tour where I ask if anyone has any questions, but I guess you can't ask me questions right now. So that sucks. Uh, we're gonna head back in. And I guess we're going to talk about, you know, the first year experience in humanities and that kind of stuff. This door is like 
the heaviest door on campus. It's like literally impossible. Literally impossible. It's literally impossible to open because it's locked right now. <laughs> but, you know, it's like you're rushing into campus and it's like that door is just like standing in your way and between you and your next class. And then it's just like, yeah, I don't know. In my head, that was funnier than it was current than the way I delivered it. Um, we're going to take another door. Uh, let's see. Great, that opened. Usually in this room, there would be people who were working on math, but I guess there's also no people in the building right now, which is why no one is working on math. Um, I guess that's sad. Um, I guess one of the things I want to talk about is art. So here is a sculpture, I guess. It's known as, its name is Chord, and apparently it's a pretty recent sculpture since like, I've seen pictures of this, like, this part of MIT without the sculpture. Yeah, see? It's only added in, like, 2015 or so. Um, there's, like, a lot of art around MIT, and uh, they all have weird names. Like, this one is named Chord. There's, like, one of them which is, like, a box in, like, five parts or something. And it's just, like, a box that looks like it has, like, five parts. I don't, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. There's also one called Elmo MIT, which is like this sculpture of like a guy. I don't know why it's called Elmo MIT, and if you know, you should tell me. Um, I think the piece of art whose name makes the most sense is called Bars with Color, and it's in like Building 6B, where... Actually, I can just show you. It's pretty nice. Uh, it's in like Building 6B, and the way that it is is like, you know, it's behind this door that only people in the physics department have tap access to. So I can't actually come in and show you, but I can like, you know, show you what it looks like on the outside and it just looks really cool. Before we head there, you see that nose and you see how like it's a different color from like the rest of the sign. Apparently people touch the nose for good luck. Well, that sounds unsanitary because you should sanitize probably after touching the nose, I guess. Or did we go past it? No, no, it's here. It's here. No, wait, what? Okay, it's definitely that one. It's this one. It's totally this one. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So this is building 6B. Yeah, this is bars of color by Solovit. It was added in 2000. Oh, wait, bars of color within squares. Yeah, and you can see there's like squares with bars of color. And I think this is the most reasonably named piece of artwork in all of MIT because all of them have weird names and I don't get why they're named like that. We're heading into building 14, Hayden Library. Um, so Hayden Library is the home to MIT's humanities department. And yes, it's a singular humanities department, course 21. Um, if this was an MIT admissions tour, once again, I'll be standing in like these things, like this. And then I'll be like, you know, I'll be like standing here, and then you'll be like sitting over there, and then like uh, pretend that that's what's happening. I'm gonna talk about the humanities requirement. So you need to take eight. You need to take eight humanities classes in order to graduate at MIT. Um, three of them must form a distribution for like the different kinds of humanities classes. So they're called HASs, and HAS stands for Humanities, Arts, and Social Science. And you have to take three classes in order to satisfy your distribution requirement. One must be a humanities class, one is an arts class, and one is a social sciences class, as the name suggests. Uh, also, three or four of the eight classes that you take have to form a concentration. A concentration is basically like a bunch of classes that are related to the same thing. So for example, I want to concentrate in like either linguistics or writing, and one of those, I'm still not sure. Some people concentrate in economics, game theory, Spanish, French, German, Japanese, um, ancient medieval studies, music, philosophy, like you name it, there probably is a concentration related to it. So I think that's pretty cool. The humanities classes in MIT are actually pretty good. I've never heard anyone say that they took a humanities class 
that they disliked, like really disliked at least. There are some people who are like, anyway. Um, you also have to take two writing classes in order. Yeah, you have to also take CIHs, and CIHs are like communication intensive classes. So you have to take two of them, and then you also have to take CIMs, which are communication intensive in your major. So you have to take four communication intensive classes in order to graduate. Um, I've already taken two. I've already taken my two CIHs. Like last semester, I took 21W022. 21W tells you it's like a writing class, and 022 is the specific class, which is reading and writing autobiography. And um, it was this class, like it was a small class of around like 10 or so of us, and we met in like building 66 over there, and we building 56 over there, and we just like sat and we like talked about our readings and we like wrote stuff and we workshopped each other's writing. And, you know, it was. I mean, the class was reading and writing autobiography, so all the essays in the class were, like, writing from things based on your experience, which, you know, I'm, like, have a penchant for because I guess I'm a blogger, and I guess that's what I do for a living. But, yeah, it was fun. Um, it was a great change of pace because, like, you know, back in high school, all the essays I wrote were why did Edgar Allan Poe use a raven in his poem or, like, analyze and differentiate these two political systems. And I was just like... You know, this is not the kind of writing I'm interested in. And if you are interested in writing about something, there's probably a class about it. We have CIHs about, like, you know, like I said, reading and writing autobiography. And we have, like, a CIH about intro uh, linguistics. That's what I'm taking right now. 24900, intro linguistics, where you just, like, in order to fulfill your writing requirement, you, like, write up this report about, like, this language that you do fieldwork in. It's pretty cool. Um, there's also CIHs where you get to write about music, like Intro to World Music, where you like, you know, write about music. And there's stuff like uh, ph Intro Philosophy, where you write like philosophy stuff. And there's just like a wide variety of CIHs that you could take, which is nice. Um, one of the things that I also want to talk about is how the first year thing is different. So the first semester of your first year is on PNR, that's Pass No Record, which means that you either pass the class and on your report card it's written as P, not A, B, or C, but just P. And if you don't pass the class, then it's just not recorded anywhere in your transcript, not even in your internal transcript. Like the only people who will know are like you and your advisor and like no one else, which is pretty cool. Um, because it's like, you know, it's a good way to like help first years adjust into, you know, living in MIT. For a lot of people, it's like the first time that they're living alone, the first time that they have to cook for themselves and that kind of stuff. I know it was my first time that I had to like, you know, like cook for myself and like live far away from home and deal with all of these adjustments that having the flexibility afforded by PNR was something that I really appreciated and that a lot of people appreciate as well. Oh, did I mention MIT's drop date is like really late into the semester, like two thirds of the way this semester. This is like really nice because that means that you can just drop any point before the semester and there's like no repercussion against you, which means that in the beginning of the semester, you can just like take a bunch of classes and then just like drop the ones you don't like. So you could at least like go to the first week or so of class before you decide whether to take it. Which is nice because, you know, you don't have to decide whether or not to take a class just based on description or just based on what other people tell you. You could actually go to the class. Um, yeah, well, I guess I mentioned earlier that like first years have like the first semester of PNR, but I guess it's weird now because like everyone is on PNR. So I guess we have two semesters of PNR. Funny how that works out. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to say. Yeah. Again, I would ask if you had any questions, but like, I guess you can't really ask any questions. So we're heading outside, and um, this is the green building. The green building was designed by IM Pei a couple years back. Uh, it's pretty tall. Uh, fun fact, it is currently still the tallest building in all of Cambridge. Uh, so. When Ian Pei was designing the building, he was like, oh, let's design a really tall building. And the way that Cambridge City's sit, like zoning laws at the time was like, you can only construct a building that was like at most 20 stories high, or like had at most 20 stories. So while the green building does have 20 stories, um, the first floor is actually like thrice or twice the size of a regular floor because it has its own auditorium. And also the building is on stilts, which makes it even taller. And the thing about the stilts is that, you know, there's like this passageway underneath the green building where it's just like clear. And 
the way that it's positioned is that the green building is like, you know, the Charles River is just like right across there. So you have this like straight line going from the Charles River all the way to like underneath the green building, which is like basically a wind tunnel. And it's just like got so windy that apparently on the day when it opened, they couldn't even close the doors. So that's why they put revolving doors there so that it wasn't affected that much by the wind. There's also this statue. Um, this is called like the Big Sail. Oh, I mean, that's its English name, but it actually has a different name. And apparently, so the, the myth goes is that the, 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 the sculpture was constructed in order to like help block the airflow from the river. But um, this actually isn't true because some like MIT people built like a small model and put it in like the wind tunnel that we have over there and they tested it and it's just like, it just doesn't block the wind at all. So, but it does look nice, I guess. Um, the green building is also where I'm supposed, like where I usually talk about Europe's. Uh, Europe's are undergraduate research opportunity. Europe is the U undergraduate research opportunity program. Yes, I know my acronyms. Um, a Europe is like something where, you know, you get to do research with a professor and it's for undergrads. And um, it's a, like a nice way for undergrads to get to like try out something without actually having to commit to it. Uh, I've never been in a Europe myself, but one of my friends did a Europe for course 12. Uh, course 12 is Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Science and it's housed in the Green Building over there. Um, and he did like a Europe in like involving ocean engineering where he like did some CS things in order to like analyze ocean currents. And he found out that he found like, you know, he didn't like the ocean currents part, but he did like the CS part. So yeah, he thought he was interested in like doing like course 12 stuff, but like he tried that and he discovered that he wasn't. So I guess that's just like, you know, a Europe is just like yet another way to like find out whether something is a fit for you without having to take an entire class or like, do a job in it, you know? And I think that's pretty nice. Uh, people also do Europe's for pay or for credit. Most people I know do it for pay. Uh, I haven't done a Europe myself. I, I said that this semester was supposed to be the semester where I tried doing a Europe, but like, I guess that didn't happen. 95% um, of MIT undergraduates will have done a Europe uh, before they graduate. At any given time, around 40% of our undergraduates do Europe's or some other number. Again, don't quote me on these numbers. These are probably wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this isn't also part of like my usual tour route, but I wanted to show you anyway because it's dear to my heart. So this is East Campus right behind me. It's where I live. It's where I used to live. Um, I used to live in Third West. So East Campus is like two parallels. This is the West Parallel and there's the East Parallel right behind it. And they're like each parallel has five floors each, like five floors each. And each floor has its own different culture. So you have like 10 different cultures all packed in the same dorm. And, you know, when people think of East Campus, they usually think like, you know, fire and like hair dye and like, you know, running around with clothing optionality and stuff. And while these are all true, it's like, you know, it's not even like true for the entire dorm because there's such like a diversity of different cultures that it's just hard to pin down what like the entirety of East Campus is like. For example, my floor, which is like the third floor of the West Parallel, Third West, we're named Floor Pi. And our culture is like, you know, we like doing puzzles and board games and we like experimental cooking. And, you know, we're just like very soft and we like having tea and that kind of stuff. And I think it's nice. Like, it's just nice. Like Floor Pi has been my home for the past few months. And I was just so glad that I was, you know, able to like feel like I was accepted and cared for. Uh, yeah. Also, this is Walker Memorial. It's where you'll take some of your exams. Uh, on the second floor of Walker Memorial is the Rainbow Lounge. And it's just like this entire room for like, you know, the LGBT office, but it's just also like a lounge. And it's like really nice. They're like snacks and like queer button pins that I take in and like a bunch of stickers and stuff and they're really cool and um being like I wanted to mention this because you know I'm gay myself and you know being here in MIT like I never felt that I had to hide that in fact MIT has been like very accepting and everyone I've talked to has been very accepting of this and it's just nice because you know back in the Philippines 
being gay was something that was like you know frowned upon in certain communities stigmatized and it's just none of that here you know so uh, we're gonna head into North Court recently renamed Hawkfield Court except no one I know calls it Hawkfield Court uh, but also no one I know calls it North Court anyway so that's that for you uh, we have Stata over here uh, that's building 70 something that's building 68 and yeah those are like two biology buildings and they do like biology stuff there which is probably really important and relevant given the current situation that we're at uh, also Kendall Square is like over there and Kendall Square is pretty cool because you know it's very near East Campus so like you could just like walk into Kendall Square and like eat at a bunch of places there like Chipotle there's a Chipotle at Kendall Square and it's really good um, again if this was an admissions tour I would be standing on one of these benches and giving you the spiel on Stata which I guess I'll do so that I feel like I'm giving the admissions tour even though when I'm actually not Hi, uh, this is Stata behind me. That weird building that looks weird. Um, it was designed by architect. One of the architects, it was designed by some guy. And um, this is really embarrassing. I, I forgot what I was gonna say about Stata. Uh, so we're like in the, in the tour guide manual, it says that we're supposed to pronounce it Stata. But in fact, everyone says Stata, which is like incorrect, I guess, because, you know, the people it was named after surnames are actually pronounced Stata rather than Stata. But it's what most people say. So I say Stata normally, but I'm giving the tour, so I'm saying Stata. The common joke, like one joke I've heard is that Stata should be pronounced as to rhyme with data. But then again, people also say Data, so you could also say Stata to rhyme with Data. And I guess that's the joke. Um, Stata is the home to our Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or CSAIL, and it's also home to our Linguistics and Philosophy Department. I don't know how those two are related, but it makes sense, somehow. Um, CSAIL is relevant recently because I heard that CSAIL has been like trying to like make ventilators with their resources, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, CSAIL is also home to like a bunch of labs for like Core 6 year ops, where Core 6 is like um, Core 6 is probably the most common course number you'll hear. It's electrical engineering and computer science, and a bunch of people are Core 6. I will probably end up doing a lot of course. I mean, I already took a lot of Core 6 classes, so turns out I'm actually a Course 6 major. Um, yeah. Let's see if I have tap access in this data. Stata. Stata. One of those. I'm in. I do have tap access in this data even though it's empty. It's just so weird seeing Stata empty. They should be full with people right now. Ugh. Anyway, uh, this, so this is something about hacks. Um, this is like to commemorate one of the more famous hacks. It like, you know, people put like a fire hose, they collected a fire hose into a drinking fountain in front of one of the largest lecture halls on campus, 26100. And this is like in reference to like something that a previous MIT president said that getting an education from MIT is like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, you can also see like a bunch of hacking ethics over here and some pictures of hacks, I guess. The MIT museum was the one who put this up and it's pretty cool, I guess. Uh, you can see like this cow over there, that cow. And that was like a replica of like a cow that they placed on top of the dome as well. Or at least I think it was on top of the dome. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm, what was I gonna say? So Stata is the part where I'm going to like wrap up the admissions tour. Usually, I talk about like you know Misty and like the general outcomes of people after MIT. Uh, so we have this program called the Misty, which is like the MIT Science. MIT International Science and Technology Initiative and it's basically like MIT will pay you to go to another country to like study or teach or work and that kind of stuff and it's pretty nice because like you know it's all expenses paid all you have to do is apply 
Um, I applied for Misty and I got rejected, but I'll apply again next year and we'll see what happens. A bunch of my friends did Misty. Like one of my friends went to Japan and she was really into like, you know, nanotechnology and also into anime. So I guess it was like, you know, her dream come true working in Japan on nanotechnology stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, over there, the police car. Yeah, that, that was like the actual police car that they put on top of the dome. It's not just a replica. It is the police car. Uh, you can see that, you know, it's like made, it's like actually made out of wood and it's just painted to look like a police car. So, yeah. Um, this is also the point where I talk about like, what do people do after graduating MIT? And people do like lots of things. Some people choose to like, you know, go directly into industry. Some people go to grad school. Some people take a gap year to travel. Some people volunteer. Uh, lots of different stuff. The percentages, I can't, again, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. And it just like really varies a lot depending on the course. Like among course 18, for example, there are probably more people who go to grad school than, of course 18 math, there are probably more people who go to grad school than, you know, course two, mechanical engineering, I guess. Um, I guess, oh, like one last thing that I wanted to mention. So this chalkboard is, you know, for MIT Chalk of the Day, there's like, they're like two people or like, I think there are two people who just like make this new chalk artwork here every day or like every day or so, every other day. But I guess they won't be able to do that for a while. That's their Instagram. You should follow them. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, thank you so much for bearing with me throughout the entire tour. Uh, so awkward and just speaking to my phone. Bye.